So when it, when it comes to eating fermented foods, I tell my clients to eat like Noah's are. So you want a variety and you want a small amount. You don't eat these for nutritional or food value, you eat them for their microbes. The best eating strategy is a predominantly a meat-based diet and then fermented vegetables and fermented fruit. What do you look to do with a patient's diet? I know you talked about eliminating processed foods. I know you talked about eating more grass-fed meat. Um, maybe what, what other uh, parts of that equation should we be looking at in terms of diet? Yeah, so a really interesting contribution um, to eating that as a strategy that I um, exhort all my clients to do, and so far I've been successful getting everybody to do it, is incorporating fermented foods. And uh, the reason why uh, I uh, implore and exhort my clients to eat fermented foods is not because they're food, but really for their microbial benefit. So fermented foods are rich in beneficial microbes, particularly uh, bacteria, uh, certain fungi, yeast, and uh, uh, single cell organisms that go down and make positive contributions to your microbiome when, when things like processed foods contribute um, to speciation and composition of the microbiome of, more, of, of a more pathogenic or what I call obesogenic uh, makeup. So fermented foods is really an important strategy and I encourage my clients to chew fermented foods with their main course of their meal, which is usually a meat, and um, to incorporate those microbes into that meat when they're swallowing for their you know, improved digestion and their long-term residence within the, the gastrointestinal um, community. So equal to cutting out processed foods is, is the addition of healthy food like healthy grass-fed meats, healthy ruminants, uh, game meat, and then fermented foods like kimchi, uh, kvass, uh, fermented sauerkraut, uh, curtido, fermented dairy like yogurt, um, blue cheeses, fermented cheeses, and kefir. And uh, these fermented foods really have been around for thousands of years. They're part of traditions of numerous uh, healthy cultures, uh, which uh, have aligned with uh, true uh, longevity and, the, and, and better uh, health span where there's less disease present. And so um, also important to talk about with as far as an eating uh, strategy is, is kind of a, a corollary opposite of that is the absence of eating, so fasting. So I have my clients uh, adopt a practice of increasing fasting, uh, particularly extended fasting, where I get my clients going much further than just intermittent fasting, but actually embrace um, a, ultimately a fasting period of 72 hours a week on average. So that's three straight days, three, um, 72 hours straight of zero caloric eating. So no calories during that time. And the biggest cell and reason for doing that is autophagy, which is this state of uh, optimizing existence where your cells are clear cleaning out and clearing up cellular debris and debris from just uh, daily living and physiology. So it helps to eradicate disease. So autophagy is this very exciting uh, I idealized state that everybody should be aware of and leverage, and almost nobody is. I mean, people do intermittent fasting, but it is uh, dose dependent and it picks up as you uh, fast longer. So it appears to be optimized right around 72 hours. And so that's where I have my clients uh, ideally fasting about 72 hours, maybe to 96 hours. And that's where the majority, I, I have my clients fasting on a weekly basis, um, ideally about three uh, weeks out of, the, out of the month, they'll do 72 hours, maybe one week out of the month, they'll do 96 hours. 
Wow, I've got to start incorporating some 72 hour fast. I'm I'm definitely a 16, eight uh, type of guy. I, I don't eat breakfast. I eat my first meal, uh, you know, usually around two o'clock. Um, so that's definitely interesting. I, I would call you maybe carnivore adjacent because it seems like you've got a lot of sympathies with the carnivore diet with the exception of some of those fermented foods being things like sauerkraut or kimchi, right? A lot of those fermented vegetables. Why, um, I guess, like what is, um, it, can you eat any fermented food or is it, uh, do, you, do you wanna have more different kinds of fermented foods uh, in your diet? Yeah, so when it, when it comes to eating fermented foods, I tell my clients to eat like Noah's Ark, you know, two, uh, only two of every species. So you want a variety and you want a small amount. So um, I say a good client goes and gets 20 jars and has like uh, a quarter teaspoon of each one, you know, throughout the day. So a very small amount, maybe, you know, five, five tablespoons. So not much. We're not talking, you don't eat these for nutritional or food value, eat them for their microbes. And uh, a, an average client might just get 10 jars uh, and a poor client um, will, will only get one jar and they'll hate it and they'll, they'll just have one jar. <laughs> so you, you wanna get a variety, you eat small amounts. And with regard, it is you know, different for a carnivore physician like myself who I, I eat almost all my calories are you know, in the form of me, um, the, the caloric value of my ferments are, are actually quite small. Uh, but the, the objection that carnivores typically have traditionally to vegetables are because of these anti-nutrients and toxins, uh, microtoxins, plant toxins, plant defenses that are present within uh, veg vegetable matter. Um, and the, but when you ferment uh, vegetables, they're eliminated. How much? Well, in some studies, completely. Other studies uh, show less so. And what, what it turns on is the degree to which the fermentation takes place in the conditions. So the longer the fermentation, the more idealized the, the conditions, the more these plant toxins are eliminated. So um, it's a bit of a trade-off. I am I'm, you know, sure that I get a small amount of these plant toxins but the microbial benefits that I'm getting from those fermented foods more than make up, in my opinion, for the very, very small, tiny bit of toxins that I might get. And I will go so far as to say that I think a certain amount of those toxins are beneficial because of the hormetic effect that they have and probably the best way to understand vegetables are they have a medicinal value. And so for those that are eating uh, at the exclusion of meat and they're not eating any animal proteins, I think they're getting way too many of those vegetables and are problematic. And so I think from anecdotal experience and using an MRI, the best eating strategy is a predominantly a meat-based diet and then fermented vegetables and fermented fruit. So fruit doesn't have the same degree of plant toxins and defenses that vegetables have, but they have uh, something else, um, fructose. And that extra amount of fructose is dealt with again through fermentation. So uh, I continue to eat mostly almost an entirely zero carbohydrate diet. But I'll point out to my carnivore colleagues that even though we say carnivore is zero carb, there are carbohydrates in meat in the form of glycogen and in liver. You know, there's a lot of glycogen stored. So it's really not the case that we're completely zero carb, but um, it, the, the capacity in which we absorb the, those carbohydrates are different than in my opinion, than in when they're consumed um, through exogenous carbs, through sugars and, and fruits and things along those lines. I choose to get the very small amount of carbohydrates I get from animal meats. Great. 